Hello, everyone. I'm Toby Shifsky. I'm the executive director of Dearborn Real Estate Education, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, today, our partner webinar is a look ahead uh, for real estate, and it's a state of the state. Um, and uh, traditionally, we try to do these at the end of the year when we try to get a glimpse into the future. And um, boy, I tell you, uh, last year, the glimpse into the future was pretty bright. Uh, the, the glimpse into the future this year is a little murkier, and, um, and the markets have changed. And so uh, what we're going to cover today uh, is we're going to cover kind of what's happened in the last year. So how has the market changed over the last three years? And, and what does that mean for momentum going into next year? What kind of a trend line can we look at? What are the possible uh, negative things that can happen? What are the possible positive things that can happen? What does that mean to your business? And then, and then ultimately at the end, we're gonna cover kind of uh, some real uh, key pieces that um, I think uh, I'm gonna concentrate on as an educator. And I think it might be important for you to concentrate on going into 2023. So without further ado, uh, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, Chris Robinson, who is our uh, national account manager for Dearborn, is on and, and is operating as a moderator, and he'll be able to uh, answer any specific questions you might have, any technical issues, uh, and will also be helping me uh, answer questions that come up in the chat. By all means, uh, go ahead and ask your questions in the chat, and we'll try to address them as we go through. But uh, let's go ahead and start. So the Dearborn webinar today is State of the State. Um, and what I want to do is I want to start with a polling question. Once again, we get a lot of people on here, uh, which is great. And I want to know uh, who we're talking to. So I'm going to do a poll. And once again, our polls are all anonymous. Nobody else in, in, uh, in this session with us sees what your answer is. But I'm going to go ahead and ask a poll just so we can kind of gear the conversation uh, correctly to who's here. And so poll number one is, what role do you hold at your school? If you're on your phone, this is going to pop up on your screen. You might have to swipe to a second screen on Zoom. But uh, otherwise, if you're on your desktop, go ahead and click on the answer that's for you. Are you the owner operator? Is that you? Are you the head honcho? Uh, you know, and you can do multiple uh, um, answers. You should be able to do multiple answers. So if you're an instructor and you're, you know, the education director, Great, go ahead and answer it. Just trying to get an idea of some of the roles that you, you might have at the school. All right, they're rolling in, they're rolling in. Excellent, uh, 28, 29%, uh, look at that. All right, so it's a good mix. And then also, I will always share the polls. So you will always kind of see where everybody else is at on this. And so I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. And uh, we're going to share the results. You should be able to see the results. So owner operators, 47% of you, right? This is excellent. I love it. You're in your business. You're thinking about next year. In fact, you might even be thinking about the year after that. And we're going to touch on that just a little bit too by the end of this. Administrator, right? What can I expect? What, what's coming in? How many people? Education directors, excellent. 23% of you. Instructors, 43%. Uh, and then I'm not yet associated, with, uh, not even associated with a school yet. Uh, 13%. Just, you know, we always have people interested in becoming a school and they get invited to these too. And so hopefully you're going to learn something and be ready to, you know, start your school appropriately. Okay. So let's go ahead. I'm going to stop sharing that poll and uh, I'm going to jump into our, our stuff. A little bit, one last bit of housekeeping for everybody. We're gonna to try to make this 30 minutes. I'm gonna go pretty fast and pretty quick. So uh, let's get ready. We're gonna hit it. Number one, looking back, a year in review. We can't really know where we're going without we look from where we've been. Um, in fact, I, I put on here 2022, right? Uh, in review, looking at licensing. I think we actually gotta go back to 2019. Um, we could, some could say, go back all the way to 2012 when things really started to turn around from the kind of the great recession back that started in 2007, 2008, financial crisis. And about 2012, things really started to kind of turn around for real estate. It's been a really pretty good run. And then in 2020 with, uh, with COVID uh, and the pandemic, um, we saw a lot of people out of work. We saw uh, people looking for new jobs. We saw people with money in hand from uh, COVID relief efforts. And, and it's no surprise, licensing took off. And, and if you've been in the business uh, through during that time, you, you, you would be pretty, you, I don't know what you would have done absolutely wrong, but you, you, you should have seen a growth in your business. And some people really nailed it. And some people struggle, but they, but if you're here, that means that you've, you've succeeded during the pandemic, right? 
But what started to happen was, you know, uh, in 2021, 20, uh, uh, about halfway through the year in 2021, some of that relief money started to dry up and people were going back to work and employers were finding it a tight employment economy. And, uh, and so what happens is we started to see some of those enrollments softening even in 2021, and it just continued through 2022. Um, and, and I think on, on average, what we're looking at across all of our, our partners is we're looking at, you know, being down anywhere from 15 to 28 percent for licensing enrollments during 2022 so far. And it looks like it's probably going to finish the end of the year the same way. So, so we come from this nice steady climb to a sharp uptick in, in the pandemic to a softening that's happening, right? Down 15 to 28 percent. So what does that mean for us? Well, uh, why is that? I mean, really, if you want to understand exactly what's driving enrollments and why there aren't enrollments, one of the key things I always look at, and you can look at uh, uh, um, you know, these kind of studies too, like, like this study here is from the, the, the US uh, um, uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics. And so, um, and what this is, is this is just unemployment rates historically. Um, and, and it's really since, you know, uh, 2012. And you can look at these unemployment rates as they drop and drop and drop and drop. And then in uh, January, uh, and that's really January, but actually March of 2020, when the whole pandemic hit, you can see this giant spike of unemployment that went up to 15%. And, and what happens is you've got a lot of people standing around without work saying, I got to do something. It's no secret. This helped drive our licensing enrollments, people looking for that, that new career, that, that next career, they want to take control of the life, they want to do it. Well, what happens is uh, it's a pretty good run. And we get a lot of licensing students in, a lot. Um, but as we go through 2021, you can see the rates start to drop all the way back down. So in, in November of 2020, we're, we're, we're back down to 6.7% from a high of nearly 15% in the beginning of the year. To November of 2021, we're down to 4.2% unemployment rate. So we've dropped underneath the 5% unemployment rate. And in fact, today, we're at near historic lows at 3.7% unemployment rate across the country. What does that mean? Well, that means that a lot of people are pretty happy in their jobs and or they feel like at least now that maybe they're being compensated for their jobs. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity out there. It's no secret. You know, I've found over the last 20 years that the real estate industry is is kind of an anti cyclical industry. So when unemployment goes up, our licensing uh, uh, education enrollments generally go up. And when unemployment goes down, our licensing enrollments generally go down. And you can pretty much follow that over, I don't know how many years, over the last 40 years, you might be able to do something like that. So we watch unemployment rates very close. And I can tell you that there's, there's, a, there's a kind of a magic line. And the magic line is right, ar right around 45 to 5% unemployment. You get above 45 to 5% unemployment and, and you're, 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 you're pretty good. If you're above 5% unemployment, you're you're usually doing really good because real estate is an awesome second career or third career choice. That's generally been, been the history so far. Um, so watching unemployment rates is important. And, uh, and the reason I say that is because, um, uh, in fact, just before COVID, uh, before the pandemic, you know, I think I made a joke in an executive meeting once, it was probably not the smartest joke at the time, but it was, you know, what real estate needs is a little tiny recession to get more unemployment. And, um, and that wasn't the most sensitive thing to say, but it's true. Uh, and, and so where we're sitting now, you know, people talk about a potential recession coming. We're going to talk about some of the risks involved in if there is a recession and what that means. But it might not be all as bad as you think for real estate, um, if history has anything to say about it. So uh, let's go on. <clears throat> what else is driving our, our industry? It's no secret that in 2006, 2007, 2008, there was the, the, the mortgage crisis and the financial collapse. And, and because of the mortgage crisis, uh, real estate had a kind of a really negative connotation. It was almost dirty. 
And, and I say that because I was there and I lived through it. It wasn't an appealing career. People like, oh yeah, mortgage meltdowns, an ugly mess. Homes are selling, foreclosures, short sales. Who wants to get into that mess? It wasn't a desirable uh, second career for people. So even though unemployment rates were up during that time, during the financial crisis, um, real estate wasn't attractive. Home values had dropped like crazy, short sales, foreclosures everywhere. The mortgage industry was a mess. It wasn't a, a, an appealing second career. <clears throat> Here's what I can tell you. Uh, today, uh, a little different, a um, uh, little different situation going on. But once again, if you look at this chart, you can see back in 2000, we started to have this climb in average home prices, kind of this run in real estate where, man, it's a really attractive career and, and housing's exciting. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's romantic almost because look at the home prices and the positive press. And it's no secret, we saw an even bigger run on licensing education back in 2000 through 2005 than we just did in the last two years. It was a ginormous run. And what happened was uh, uh, the housing prices were going up and that was helping because every home that sold meant more commission was being made. And, and there were transactions happening like crazy, quite a ton of investors in. Well, that bubble burst and, and you saw this, this drop in home prices, critical drop in home prices and people selling like crazy and people obviously underwater and default. And because they were financing with uh, um, really loose money that had very little um, uh, guidelines or really you know, bars anybody had to cross over in order to qualify. And so people were defaulting all over the place. So we saw a ginormous drop in home values. <clears throat> but as you look through 2012 is really kind of the tip, the, the, the point that everything turned around and started to come back up again. Well, you can see this rise in home values and the skyrocketing rise in home values since 2020. And, and this little bump right here, this little top of the peak, this little top of the peak is, is essentially June of this year. So the question is, what happens to home values in America? Because if home values are steady and they're rising steady, real estate has generally a good perception in the marketplace. And with a good perception, it's a good second career for people to come into. And so uh, if the housing market is in distress, it's not uh, an appealing second uh, career. Um, that's just kind of you know the experience that we've seen. So watching and understanding home values and home prices and and foreclosures and short sales and anything like that that maybe uh, 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 you know my, people might be thinking about here, I think is going to be critical to understanding where where our real estate licensing education market goes because kind of so goes the housing industry, uh, you know the, the the real estate industry, so goes our business. That's not a big reach. I mean, that, that's what we do. We, we provide licensing, continuing education, post-licensing and professional development to the real estate industry. So, but knowing which, which factors to look at, I think is, is, was important for me. You know, I've got 20 years of trying to figure this out and I'm sharing it with you so that you can you know, take your own look and into your own market and understand really what's going on in, in your area. And, and have we peaked? Uh, is it a is it a severe drop? Or is it a slight drop? Is it a small drop? Is it you know because the, these 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 things go up, they go down just like the interest rates go up and they go down. Um, so does home values. Uh, the long look is uh, what is the perception within uh, the marketplace about real estate. So, I ask a question for you guys: What are you seeing in your home market? All right, so I'm going to launch poll number two. And uh, poll number two is, what are you seeing in home prices in your area? I think it's key. I think it's one of those things as an educator uh, and as a business operator, you are going to absolutely need to be aware of this. What is the perception of what's happening in a marketplace? So I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll. Go ahead and take a whack at this. Um, once again, if you're on your cell phone, you may need to slide to another screen to find the poll. But uh, the answers are possible here. Um, Go ahead. We got 45% uh, coming in already. Ooh, look at that. Prices are still climbing like crazy, uh, I think is answer number one. You can only answer one of these. And so prices are still increasing, but, you know, not like before. You know, they aren't at the 10, 12, 16% we've seen, but uh, they're, still, they're still increasing. 
or prices are coming down, you know, slightly, mm, just a little bit, uh, or prices, man, in my area are falling like a rock. Uh, and then finally, you know what? Prices, they're, they've just kind of stalled. They're, they're not climbing. They're, 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 they're not falling either. They're just kind of, eh, just kind of sitting now. All right, look at that. I think we've got nearly everybody has responded. Five, I'm going to go ahead and close this in five, four, three, two, one. All right, I'm going to share the results. Look at this. Nobody says price, prices are climbing like crazy town. Hmm. Yeah, I get that. Actually, we all know that was unsustainable. Can't do that. Prices are still increasing, but not like before, 27%. So 27% of you are in marketplaces that's like, ah, they're still climbing. I mean, and when we say climbing, you got two things to look at here. And I think this is important for us as we go forward. Uh, two things to look at. There is a month over month. So from previous month, are we seeing an increase in, 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 in sale prices? And then there's year over year. So like, all right, we just finished November. So November versus previous November. Are we up, up over previous November? And I think just about everywhere in the country is still up over previous November. So year over year, still up. But kind of that trending in your month to month, are they still going up? Are they coming down a little bit? And so look at that, prices coming down slightly, 59%. I think that's probably the, the overwhelming favorite. How about this? None of them are prices falling like a rock. None of them. And I don't see that either. Um, in fact, I don't think we're going to see that. Maybe in a couple select markets, you might see that, but nobody here has saw it. And then finally, you know, no, it's not climbing. It's not falling. It's just kind of sitting, which is great, actually. Um, you know, one of the things we talk about is what kind of a market is this? Is it a seller's market? Is it a buyer's market? And um, uh, 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 some people say that we might be entering, uh, you know, what is called uh, nobody's market. It's not a seller's market, it's not a buyer's market. And um, uh, it's just kind of a balanced market right now. And we may be seeing that and it was just sitting and it may be teetering um, and it might dip a little bit to be of that buyer's market. And I think a, a lot of experts believe that we're gonna enter into a little bit of a buyer's market as we maybe see some sort of a pullback. But, but uh, I'm gonna show you in a second that um, you know realtor.com uh, uh, who has a ton of statistics, really good tool for you guys to go to realtor.com, um, ton of statistics, a ton of, uh, of, of tools for you to kind of see what's really happening. Um, they, they don't actually think that uh, prices are going to fall that much at all. In fact, they still think they're going to be up year over year uh, for av average home prices. Um, but what else drives kind of uh, our industry, our, 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 our transactional industry in real estate? The other key indicator I always look at, mortgage rates. And, uh, and mortgage rates have been front and center. They have really kind of uh, uh, stolen the show, so to say. And so what does that mean? And so here's the, the mortgage rates in the last, really the last year. Um, they've gone from you know somewhere around 3.25% uh, uh, for a 30-year fixed a year ago to, you know, 6.49%. I think this is as of like December 1st. Yeah, as of December 1st. And it's been fluctuating, you know, some has gone over seven, it's come back to six and a half, depending where you are, depending on the home value, depending on uh, your credit score, you know, somewhere uh, between six and a half and, and seven and a half, I think I see bouncing all over the place. How about this? So how about the, uh, you know, the, sometimes some things are so old, they're new. Adjustable rate mortgages, remember those? How many people here, boy, I don't have a poll question for this, but how many people here remember when adjustable rate mortgages were kind of really first introduced in the late 70s? Do we have any of you there that were there during you know, the uh, late 70s when interest rates went to 16, 17, 18%? And um, how about that? You think we're in a, in a mortgage crisis now? You go ahead and throw it in the chat if you remember uh, adjustable rate mortgages coming on the scene. And, uh, and how they really kind of uh, saved a lot of the, the housing market from 1979 to like 1983, because adjustable rate mortgages, uh, as the fixed rate mortgages go up, adjustable rate mortgages, oh my God, yes, look at Lawrence, uh, adjustable rate mortgages are tied to uh, different things. They're tied to the, the one-year treasury notes, right, three-year. Um, 
they're different and, and you might equate them more towards uh, short term lending because your your uh, mortgage rate, you know, is uh, fixed for a certain period of time and then it can adjust. Well, uh, look at that. Sixteen percent. Twenty six thousand dollars. Nice. Uh, like they own that home today, I bet, Christine. Uh, so but the deal is um, we're seeing these mortgage products come back. And now that 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 gap, that margin between fixed rate and adjust rate mortgages are, are, are really at one percent or uh, almost over one uh, percent. So you might get a fixed rate at six and a half. You can get into a five one arm today at you know five and a half or five point seven five. Um, in fact, what does it have here? Yeah, five point seven six percent, which is significant. In fact, if you look over on the right, you know um, what has really been the impact on 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 the cost of owning a home. Everybody talks about buying the home for a certain price, and that's important. But uh, a uh, vast majority of people who buy a home, they, they, it isn't the sale price, it's what's my monthly payment going to be? And so what can you really afford? And, and if you look at it, you know, during the pandemic, there's been a ginormous rise in the cost of owning a home. So we go from 2020, the median sales price, if we went back a couple of slides, you'd see the median sales price is like $224,000 or something like that. And and the fixed rate mortgage in 2020 was 3.25%, you know, that monthly payment with 20% down was $1,123. Well, today that same house is $300,000 with a, you know, 6.49% uh, fixed rate mortgage. And you're looking at 20, um, almost $2,440 a month for that same house. That's a big difference. So what does that mean to the real estate industry? Well, what, what that means is, uh, uh, are there enough buyers to buy what's available? And, and the, the, the key during the pandemic, when the money was cheap, was there were a lot of buyers. And, uh, and they wanted to buy homes, and they kept driving the price up. The key is now, is, is there still that kind of demand? And, uh, and the, the good news is, and the bad news is, is um, uh, there will always be homes that have to be sold. You know, I learned this from from a gentleman I respect very much, been in the business for, you know, 80 years, believe it or not. And he says, people always got to buy, people always got to sell for one reason or another. People die, people divorce, move, you know, living situations, kids, rooms, all that kind of stuff. And so what happens is uh, uh, things have to keep moving. So mortgage rates, what do we think is going to happen in mortgage rates over the next year? And, and if they climb to 10, 12%, it's going to slow things down more. Might there be forces out there that will actually put pressure on reducing mortgage rates? One very big thing is happening in 2024. And uh, we should already be talking about it for in real estate. And that is the presidential election. I'm not going to get political on you. It doesn't really matter who's in office before a presidential election. Nearly every presidency, every single um, administration tries to exhibit some force on mortgage interest rates leading up to an election because it's no secret uh, home sales drives our economy, a big chunk of our economy, and they want home sales. And uh, the good news is there is a light at the end of the tunnel for us on mortgage interest rates happens to be in 2024, but there is a ramp up period that needs to happen. Um, and we are dealing with inflation right now. So there's some counter pressure there. But believe me, there will be some pressure coming. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. All right. So I wanted to share this with you. Uh, you know, in doing the research, um, uh, I look for a bunch of different sources. I look for a mortgage bankers association. I don't know if you guys know the Mortgage Bankers Association, but they do a really kind of clear picture on what they think is happening in the, the finance world in, in mortgage lending. And, uh, and they tally up how many transactions and they tally up, you know, um, uh, refinances and they tally up new construction. They do a really good job. And I find their numbers to be very, very accurate. I also find uh, 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 the National Association of Realtors does a very good job. I tend to find the National Association of Realtors uh, generally paints a pretty, pretty glossy picture. Um, pretty, pretty, they take the positive side on things. And I get it. I like it. I, I understand that. Um, where the Mortgage Bankers Association kind of takes a, a very, you know, just by the numbers sort of a thing. 
and um, and maybe a little more critical look at it. You got to find your resources where you go to. I'm just sharing some with you. Um, but this is from the from Realtor.com, which isn't quite uh, the National Association of Realtors. Uh, it's from Realtor.com. That organization they they have stats, right? They have lots of stats. They have their their Realtor.com website drives uh, hundreds of millions of people a year to that site, and and uh, they track all those transactions. And so. Uh, one of the things we've got to do here is kind of look at uh, where we were and where we're going. And then what they do is they do a really nice thing. They're doing a forecast to kind of tell us what's happening in the real estate industry and, uh, and gives us a little historical picture. If you look at, you know, mortgage rates and you want to look at from 2013 to 2019, the historical average for mortgage rates was 4%. That's low. For the last 40 years, the historical average is 7.7%. For over the last 40 years, 7.7. So when we see, you know, they, oh, they got to 7%. Now it's like, well, that's historically average. We've just been in a very low interest rate time period in history. So uh, very unique, very peculiar. Um, but but what, is it, what does it really mean? Um, for 2022, we averaged 5.5%, right? Uh, and uh, uh, by year end, they think, obviously, here coming in December, that we might be sitting around 7.5%. I think it's going to be anywhere from 6.5 to 7.5%. And, uh, and what do they think is going to happen next year? But they think that uh, it's going to average 7.4%. But if you look, they also think by the end of the year, it's going to be 7.1%, which means they also are seeing that there's going to be a drop in that interest rate. So, what does it all mean? Uh, it means that uh, interest rates do affect transactions. It does, does affect how much home people can afford. And, uh, and the key here is uh, we need people to afford as much as possible uh, because that means transactions. That means that the industry looks healthy and it can support wages. Um, and that's good. So uh, uh, the other thing we want to look at is affordability. And um, in here, uh, uh, Realtor.com, they're saying that the home prices are still going to appreciate year over year next year by 5.4% going up from this year, which, you know, uh, is up 2.10% from the year before. And um, existing home sales, they do see home sales dropping, mm, you know, 14.1% down to 4.53 million from 5.28 million home sales this year. So transactions drive the money in the industry. Every trans, nobody gets paid until there's a transaction, essentially. What we will find is that actually somebody does get paid in our business now without a transaction, and that's important to us. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later because there are some brokerage models out there that not only rely on, on a transaction happening, but they rely on having agents in their brokerage to pay fees. So the brokerage models are changing over time, and it's not just commission-driven. There is a fee-driven component to it. This isn't bad for us if we're in education, because uh, brokers who may be um, uh, losing some commissions may actually be recruiting uh, agents for and new agents in order to collect fees. So I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. <clears throat> um, Existing home sale inventory, well, there's one good thing happening. Uh, they think the, the realtor.com believes we're going to be up 22.8% from this year. So more options. Once again, coming back to that, maybe a balanced market or a nobody's market, not buyers, not sellers, so ba ba balanced market. And then single family housing starts. This is another key long-term issue that you should be aware of that's going to come into play to what we think is going to happen next year. And that is, there's a shortage. There's a housing shortage in America. And we're going to find later that that's anywhere from, you know, 2.8 to 5.5 million units. Think about this. Uh, uh, we're short that many units, meaning there, there is a pent up demand for that many units that we don't have built. And, and if you look at it, how many actual transactions do we have this year? You know, 5.28 million it's as if we have an entire year's worth of pent up demand for new construction alone. So new construction may be an important part of where we go. Right now, some of those new construction companies are, are suffering a little bit because of pricing. That it's no secret, new construction can be up to a third 
more expensive than existing homes. And it's a part of what dragged the existing price of homes up also is that to replace it with new was so much more expensive. We are seeing some of that regression in that pricing probably happening more so uh, there than in, in existing homes. But as supply chains continue to loosen up and as, as, as inventory becomes more available, um, we should see that correcting itself a little bit. But the deal is it could take a decade to uh, overcome that, that, that deficiency in existing homes. Um, more on that in a little bit. So uh, another key thing is uh, home ownership rates uh, near at historic highs at 65.7%. So nearly two thirds of all Americans own a home, the American dream. Um, and, uh, and that's good. That's good for our business. It's good for, for everything. Uh, as far as generational wealth, it's good for, you know, uh, uh, generally the most, the, the widest, broadest consensus is that's good. Unless you happen to own a home and the homes <laughs> lose value of 20, 30% uh, or more, uh, like they did back in 2006 and seven and eight. Um, of course, we've recovered that, but that is a risk with home ownership. And then uh, the other key here that we watch is rent growth. So what does that mean? Rent growth, that means uh, the cost of actually renting. Um, so my rent keeps going up. I, I, you can see that they're putting rent control measures in. Um, and so uh, that means that there's still a demand and that rent will continue to rise as, as housing uh, is at a shortage when there's not enough places for people. The one thing that does for our industry is that as rents come up uh, and, and uh, it actually makes owning a home uh, not as expensive. So if I'm spending $1,100 a month on rent and I could buy a home and I could get it for $1,700 a month, um, uh, the gap isn't as significant uh, as maybe it, it once was. Um, so we did see over the last three years a, a, a progression out of renting into owning, which we hadn't seen in, in decades. Um, it's slower now, but so key watching those interest rates and when they drop down because rental rates will stay high and interest rates will drop, meaning that uh, buying a home and that monthly payment will drop closer towards rental rates, which should help also drive sales. All right, okay. So James, we're almost there. Uh, we're going to get into. Uh, I, I know we're 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 almost uh, out of time, but let's let's jump into this. So <clears throat> real quick, how many licensees? Uh, approximately in the country, three million, right? Uh, One point six million are realtors as of October of 2022. And the reason this is important is, is really, I can just boil it down to a couple things. Number one is age. Uh, at the very end of this, the last bullet, 66% are female and the median age of all realtors is 56. The median age is 56. There's one thing that has uh, not happened in the last three years. And that is uh, the kind of the uh, statistically average rate of retirement out of our industry. Ooh, people, People who've been in the industry a long time, a lot of connections, their phone rang and then they said, sell my house for me. They didn't even put the, the, the sign in the ground and they sold it over the last three years. There will be people leaving our industry, natural attrition uh, through retirement, age, all that kind of stuff that hasn't happened in the last three years. So there will be people going out, which means there are openings and there are opportunities coming in on the front side of the funnel, which is where we're at with real estate licensing. Uh, this is a key stat. I think everybody might want to be aware of this. Approximately 25% of active residential agents have been licensed since COVID. This is from Realtor.com and the National Association of Realtors. 25%, it's estimated, of active real estate agents have been licensed since COVID. They don't know any other market. This may be an opportunity for you. They don't know a kind of a balanced market. They don't know a buyer's market. They don't know how to market a listing. They don't know what to do when you don't have a showing in three weeks on a property. They don't get that. That may be an opportunity for us also going forward. <clears throat> All right, a look ahead. Licensing education for 2023. What do we think is going to happen? Uh, as long as interest rates and unemployment rates stay about the same, uh, I believe we're going to see the same levels of licensing students that we saw in the last half of 2022. That's what I think. Looking at everything, 
That's what I think is going to happen as long as, you know, interest rates and unemployment rates stay at the same. So unemployment at 3.7, interest rates six and a half to seven and a half percent. That's what we, that's what I see. Potential negative events that could uh, kind of uh, make that worse. Typical recession, maybe. Unemployment will climb, but that's not always necessarily bad for real estate licensing. As long as the real estate market isn't impacted negatively by the recession, meaning that there isn't a ginormous drop off in home prices. If there's a super recession, batten down the hatches. And those are the two big events that can happen that may negatively affect. One of them might not actually negatively affect us. All right, <clears throat> the positives, there are positives. Uh, 2024 is an election year. Look for the Fed, right, to start buying back mortgage bonds again. The, the administrations, the, I said this before, they will look to any way they can to try to, to bring down mortgage interest rates, which will get those markets moving again. That's a good thing for us. We want those interest rates low. We want home selling again. Uh, and, and the good news is, is 2024, there's a stake in the ground and it is the presidential elections. Retirement, licensees leaving the business uh, and how that affects brokerages. Well, like I said before, a, a lot of these brokerages have uh, fee bases in place and, and a lot of the, uh, the, the more established agents pay heavy fees and they don't share big commissions. And so how are they gonna replace fees uh, from people retiring from the business? Headcount. And so brokerages are still recruiting. We're contacted every day from people who are gearing up recruiting uh, uh, measures right now who want to be actively recruiting new people into the industry, even in this softening market, because they see you know, a year out and two years out that they need to have people uh, to do this business. <clears throat> Housing shortage, talked about it a little bit, 2.8 to 5.5 million units. New construction may be a place to focus. New construction studies, new construction uh, uh, um, uh, training, even in professional development for how to do new construction might be something that we could look at. All right, <clears throat> where to concentrate, concentrate your efforts to maintain or increase revenue? A couple key things, number one, you got to increase your average order value. Look at this. Uh, what is your suggestion, James asks, to say, uh, increase sales where competition or other real estate schools are offering basic classes for $69? I would have relationships. I would have create a value proposition with your students to say, you can go over there and you can take a discounted Groupon education because here's what you're going to get when you go there. Here's what you're going to get when you come to us. When you come to us, we know you want a career in real estate. And this is what we're going to do that's different. This is how we're going to support you. This is how we're going to assure that you have a, a positive student outcome. This is, these are the things we do to make sure of that, right? We have fantastic instructors. We have fantastic content and materials. We, we have a support network that can support you to help you get through the education. You can go buy on Groupon and good luck because... You bought and they don't really care if you ever showed up. So you have to find, James, your value proposition on what it is you're going to differentiate yourself when it comes to just competing head to head with some of the large national educators who discount down to nothing. That's, that's what you have to do. And, and, and the way that I would uh, compete in those situations is I would compete with relationship building, relationships with my existing students, asking them for their business, asking them for their friend's business and referring and, and, and incentivizing that referring and, and, and decision makers in my marketplace. I would cherish those relationships with decision makers, brokerages, managers who are sending you their people. I would cherish those relationships during this time. <clears throat> I would also look at uh, uh, increasing the average order value of my products by packaging. How can, when somebody decides to buy with me, can I sell them everything they need for their, for their goals and their dreams? How do I do that? I know at, at, at Dearborn, uh, through RA Campus, we offer different packages and options for people. And, and I can tell you that you can get up to 20% you know, of the people who buy from you to buy your most expensive package. Once they decide to buy with you, they, they want a career. They want it to be successful. And, and if you can lay out how this package makes them successful, they will buy it. 
In fact, uh, you're even helping yourself. If somebody's buying a career builder uh, package on RE campus, it costs uh, $200 more, uh, which is a, almost a $100 revenue split on average for you. Uh, what does that mean for the student? That means not only do they get the licensing education, not only are they getting exam prep or QBank, but they're also getting a roadmap for how to be successful in the business. We all know that real estate licensing doesn't necessarily tell you, teach you everything you need to do to be successful in real estate. It teaches you the laws, the rules, the statutes, according to what the state requires. What are you doing to help them be successful? How do you let them know what they have to do the first time? The first time that, that they, they sit down with their license and they go to work. Because when they come out of licensing, and regulators don't let us teach us this, they don't know how many phone calls a day they need to make. They don't know how many emails they need to send. They don't know how to manage their, their sphere of influence. They don't even know how to talk about getting a, 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 um, an appointment with a buyer or seller. So find those products, find those, those professional development pieces. And, and like, that's why we provide Real Estate Accelerator because that's what they learn in that. And that's a simple thing for our, our, our education partners who are using RE Campus to be able to sell to those students. Uh, it, it doesn't take any more taxing, anything else on your part. We, we do all that work. So if that's appealing to you and you wanna be able to do that, Real Estate Accelerator inside those career builder um, packages is it can be an important play of raising your average order value. Do everything you can for positive student outcomes. I said it earlier, James. How are you going to differentiate yourself? <clears throat> and how are you going to then tap into that success? So do everything you can to get those students through, right? Have a positive student outcome so they can reach their goals. And then how are you managing that relationship with that student? Remember, it's about relationships. And, and that student and that students, and how do you get that student to make sure they come back to you? We're going to talk about it right here, right? Do not lose your post-licensing students. Do not, do not, do not lose your post-licensing students. Engage them early and engage them often. Hopefully you have an email drip campaign or you have a letter writing campaign that you are sending to your licensing students to say, hey, listen, here's the requirement. Here's what it is. Here's what you need to do. Um, and, you know, here's how we're going to take care of you. Do not lose your post-licensing. You saw a ton of new licensing students come in. Do not lose those post-licensing students. Those have to be sacred to you. They have to keep, they love you already because they completed their education with you. You've got to keep them. Same thing with your CE students. Keep your CE students. Go get more, but keep the ones you got. And build the relationship and ask them for the business. Just how when you're in real estate, I'm a licensed real estate agent. <clears throat> it took me five years to figure out to ask my clients for referrals, for business. I didn't do it first five years. What a mistake. Hopefully you're asking your customers, your students for referrals. Be creative. How you do that is up to you. But do not lose that relationship. Keep that relationship. The other part we talked about kind of extensively already, but are there other professional development opportunities for them? It's not easy selling professional development on its own. It had to have a, a particular niche or a particular need within a marketplace. And what we're going to find in the next couple months, in the next six months, is there may be a particular need in your marketplace. How can you fill that? How can you drive a, prop, a value proposition that people are willing to pay for? Is that there for you? So we are working on uh, some designation education, still about six months out from being ready. So unfortunately, I can't even announce it here, but those are some of the things we're looking at uh, as an organization. <clears throat> no, that's it uh, for, for, for the kind of the top level view. I know we went almost 45 minutes. That's longer than I expected, but, and I know you guys all have uh, some great questions. Uh, uh, feel free once again to contact uh, Chris Robinson uh, at any time um, and, and contact your uh, representative from Dearborn at any time um, and uh, they can help you kind of establish what you need to do for your business um, for the 2023. Um, do I see it being a bleak out, out, uh, uh, a, a bleak um, um, forecast for 2023? 
I don't. I see it kind of being more of the same of what we've seen in the last six months in 2022. I do think there's some lights at the end of the tunnel. Uh, uh, one of them, like I said, was uh, in interest rates and pressure from administration to bring that down. Possible uh, uh, increase in unemployment that could help us. Um, are there some big, dark, dark uh, angry monsters around the corner like a super recession? Sure there is. But then again, everybody's going to be in the same boat then. Everybody. Um, uh, and the good news is, is real estate year after year, decade after decade has proven itself to be resilient. Be smart, preserve your relationships, cherish them, and keep those relationships that you have right now. Thank you, everybody. Look forward to a 2023 full of challenges. We'll be back uh, every month with a, another uh, webinar trying to share some insight to help you be successful. And hopefully you're sharing back with us. If you have any questions, you can email me directly. You can email the sales ops team at dearborn.com or you can uh, contact Chris Robinson. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.